Utopia tonight. Gentlemen, how are you? I loved the uh, the intro, the visual intro to Thank the you. show. It, it is an exact uh, picturesque description of indigestion. That's what <laughs> it's confusing. There's still yeah. parts of it that seem okay, and then you get even sicker. It's fantastic. I love that. Uh, <laughs> that's what I I wanted to give people heart palpitations right before they yeah. came on. Like sure, Ajita, I, as, yes. the, as as our grandpas would say. Yes. I'm stunned that we've had guests that haven't been totally thrown off by it because Tom can see them in the background basically before they actually come on. And I'm always worried about that last bit where that old man is like <laughs> fucking tracing his pieces of shit. Because we yeah. had some like, we, we, you know, we have uh, if it's comedians, I don't really care because comics, yeah. you, you, can, you can't throw them off or anything. But we've had some actors on and stuff before i'm like maybe not a good idea <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> that it's always interesting to see what their reaction is like tommy chong like i was, I was like i want to see which way they're gonna break are they gonna be like shaking the head or like or they're like yeah right on <laughs> <laughs> at one Look, point I had uh, saturday third show that's what that intro is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you still got to do a set, so you don't really yeah. care what's happening in front of you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. At one point, I had to I had to rearrange the images in there because I loved that dude at the end. I still, if I could find that guy, I'd bring him on immediately. That yeah. dude's my fucking hero. I don't know who he is. I don't even know if he's still alive. I hope he made it through COVID. Um, yeah. But uh, it was when uh, I don't know if you saw the video, but it was when the Capitol uh, insurrectionists were in town and you know while everyone else was safely tweeting or whatever he just he just stood outside on his doorstep and just started sc screaming down the street and i was like good for you sir yeah it's impressive yeah he decided i am going old school technology <laughs> <laughs> i'm just standing on my porch yelling at people yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly he went full get off my lawn and it's in it's yeah. in the city so there's no lawn so yeah he was like he's uh, literally like get out of town man get out of my yeah. town yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I had to switch those around at one point because i think the video i wasn't paying attention and it had uh it had like the blm stuff right before he did that so it looked like he was shouting at them and oh, i was like yeah yeah it's the, it's the wrong message <laughs> yeah like, i switched everything around yeah right right fun. you're uh, that's uh you're learning editing on the fly <laughs> oh dude i fucking suck at this shit i mean it, it is <laughs> it's absolutely brutal I, w I every time i go to put something together like that or or even even like you know cutting clips of this and and throwing it up online in my head, I know somebody could do it better, like 10 times better. Well, yeah, but that's, you know, nowadays there's there's literally five-year-olds with their own channels on YouTube. <laughs> who could just oh, swamp us with their technological ability. But I so think where we true. left this was the name of my album is What Was I Thinking? That's right. Yeah. Sorry about <laughs> <laughs> Streaming everywhere. Oh, Apple Podcast, yes. Apple, uh, whatever. Awesome. There it is. What was I thinking? Look at that. Little, yeah. little bottom did you put crawl. that together during COVID or did you get it out before COVID? I recorded it uh, in September of 19 and it came out in uh, September of 20. They, we held We were trying to figure out when to release it. 800 pound gorilla out of Nashville. Those guys are great. Oh my God. We were just talking about that. <laughs> yeah. It's like you read yeah. our minds and in the green room, we were discussing where 800 pound gorilla was from. Right. Yeah. Right from Nashville. Nashville, you know Danny yeah. Robinson? Yeah, sure. From APA. Okay. I know I yeah. know Danny when he was a young agent. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, I'll tell him you said that. He'll, yeah. love, he'll love that. I was I I'll was age us both right now. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> he called me. I was, I was talking to him like a, I don't know, like about a week ago or whatever. And he was like, he's like, You've got stuff, right? He, and I was like, Yeah. And he's like, Well, it was like, get it over to me and I'll get it over to 800 pound gorilla. And then I I wasn't I knew who they were, but I was telling yeah. Tom about it, and he had no idea. And I was so I was like, "That's the other thing too." Is now I'm got I'm going through my shit and trying to, you know, pick the best thing to send over, which is oh, nerve wracking. Yeah, as it is. that's always yeah, that's always uh, mm -hmm. 
a very weird thing, especially now, uh, because uh, comedians now have to have albums out like I would say even less than a year. But yeah. but even if it's a yearly cycle, you'd have an album out. So mm-hmm. you're taping stuff, you know, in your car, uh, you know. <laughs> At the in the parking lot at Costco, anywhere yep. w- where is a venue, and it's really interesting because I'll be listening and I'll go, I can hear where that bit would kill. It's good, but it would kill in like six months. But nobody yeah. has the time anymore to to just say, oh, I'm going to carve that out of out of mm-hmm. raw wood for another six months and then put it up. They go, no, because in six months you got to have another video out or another yep. album out or something. So. The uh, the the production line it has picked up speed, like yeah. that Lucy episode where the the yeah, fucking chair is just coming <laughs> down. You know that's the pace at which at which uh, comedians now have to turn out material. Yeah, and it's crazy. It is, and you never feel like you're caught up. I mean, we were just there's a um, God there's a there's a there's this app that just coming out. We had a you know meeting with these guys at a MIT or whatever, and it's a great app. It's awesome. But uh, it better be if they're from MIT. Jesus, it, it, it's a great thing. But here's the thing about this shit. And you can tell me if you think differently or whatever. But the thing that shit drives me crazy is I can't stand the conversation that's always had where it's like, you know, there's so much out there now for comedians. You can do so much shit on your own. You know, you can you can self-produce your own shit. The problem is that every time there's another app that comes out, you they, that app doesn't it's not there to help you. You got to bring no. your followers over there. You got to bring your content over there. And yeah. it's like. I always want to be like, what part of this is benefiting me? <laughs> I just, oh, no. You know, here's what happened uh, in the last 20 years to, to 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, in all of America, research and development departments stripped away, regardless mm-hmm. of the industry, gone. Yeah. They're going yeah. like, you know, these 50 <laughs> guys at Chevrolet carving clay models. Nah, no, there's just uh, two geeks in a corner. Just <laughs> brrr, <laughs> new car, brrr, new car. <laughs> so that's all gone. So, you know, and they did it to save a lot of dough. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, um, in all aspects of whatever industry. Uh, but, you know, but the downside is, which is the case in uh, entertainment uh, quite a bit now. There's no place to go really um, pay your dues. You know, in right. music and comedy, there's no place. They just throw up another uh, competition show and then, <laughs> you know, <laughs> somebody wins it and then you go, yeah. okay, well, but can they do 20 in a club? I mean, can, you know, right. And right. The, the answer is probably not. So all of that stripped away and then mm. it got worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, mm. To the point where now it's literally like you, you can't give anybody a script. They're not going to read it. You got to shoot right. some of it. Uh, you got to create a sizzle reel or whatever project it is. Or better yet, you just go do it on mm-hmm. YouTube, the whole fucking thing. And, yeah. and then see if there's an audience for it out there. I don't know how comedians do it right now because nothing is monetized except clubs. And those have been you know yeah. uh, out, of, out of the cycle for two years. It's it's yeah. incredibly disheartening and frustrating. Like even even to this point. So my writing partner and I, we put out a movie that I had been like working on, like a short film, like a year before uh, or years before or whatever. I had this idea. It's it's called um, uh, Dup It. It's on Amazon Prime. It, but it's only it's eleven minutes. It's a short film that I put together. It's about a dude uh, battling depression, and he manifests it into a a puppet that he calls Dup It. Right. So we we put the we wrote the script we shot the the thing we did it in like three weeks no budget right um, you know got it out there we got press for it um, people really seemed to love it it had a uh, like a bit of a thing uh, the Henson Company which is I love the Muppets right so yeah. they called my manager I flew out to L A had a meeting with them talked about making it into a series COVID hits obviously everything goes on pause. And to this fucking day, man, like it's super frustrating because I can't, we can't get anything with it. I just held a, yeah. um, like an, an event for it because I figured it would drum up some... the, You know, using COVID as an excuse for not being able to do a puppet <laughs> show <laughs> is a little weak. Right. It totally, I, I completely, I completely agree. I we, apologize um, for going full Andy Kindler on the take into the camera, <laughs> but. 
<laughs> but it, it deserved it. I mean, it did. You know, puppeteers are easily four to five feet from each other to start with. Yeah. And then the puppets, they are supposed, they're not going to get COVID. The puppet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, in They're fact, one of, my, uh, one of my sponsors on my podcast, uh, which features my alter ego sportscaster, Chat Waterhouse, who just is loaded <laughs> with bad sponsors. It's a great horrible, name. Horrible, uh, yeah, um, you know, analogies and things like that. And one of his mm-hmm. sponsors is Pinocchio's, Nevada's <laughs> only all puppet brothel, open during the pandemic. So <laughs> that's great that kills me that they, they yeah. wouldn't pick it up <laughs> yeah they wouldn't pick it up they not only wouldn't pick it up they were like they wouldn't say no like yeah, they didn't say no. no so they wouldn't say no but then they would kept going let's touch base in like three months we'll see where we're at then and then i would fucking fall for the three month call yeah. again and then like i held this event for it to drum up some more shit with it gary gullman came on said he loved like gave us a great bunch of quotes oh that's awesome loved, yeah, good, you know, and he had just had the yeah. Great Depression on and stuff. Right. And then literally we started pitching it to a couple more people and they were like, um, I don't get it. Why is it, why, why don't you do A, B, C, and D? And at one point I was like, I am, and my buddy was like, which I understand, but he was like, well, why don't we reshoot it? And I was like, how about no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how about, I, it's, I, I, I had to figure out, like, I was like, I got to walk out. Not, if anybody wants to sell it, I'll sell it. It is. I got proof of concept, a script. Yeah, I, I think you're you know. off the hook if you just go in and say, you know, guys, I didn't do this project to create even greater depression. <laughs> <laughs> I did it to try to lift myself out of depression by getting a freaking job. Right. Oh, that's good. That's what I'm going to use, if you Man. don't mind. That's exactly well, yeah, what I'm going to say. Go for it. Go for it. Absolutely. Yeah. It's fucking, but, but that's what. But to the thing is, that's it. Like they just want you to keep, you know. I would much rather tell if somebody tell me to fuck off or say no instead of going like, "What if you spent more time making yeah. more shit we're not going to watch?" Nobody's you know, like, got those balls anymore. That's the no. whole thing. As you know, there's so many analytics now mm-hmm. in the process at virtually every level of the process, and there's something great about that. You yeah. really can hone in on what your audience is, but there's also there's nobody really left. HBO still a little bit, I think. Who, who will just go, uh, you know, man, eh, fuck it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll do it. You know, you know, who just go, I like it. I'll give yeah. it a shot. I mean, these two shows on either side of me mm-hmm. uh, are benefited from executives, from Michael Fuchs to Bridget Potter mm-hmm. uh, to Carolyn Strauss, who just said, you know what? Let's do it. And of course, it, totally different structure to show business at that at that point, you know. Mm-hmm. But still to be able to go, you know, we we like it. We think it fits our brand, although nobody was using the word brand back then, but you right. know, it fits our groove, it fits our thing, man. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I, you know, especially Dennis. Dennis, there we go. There you wow. go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll get television. I swear to God, I'll get it. <laughs> You can see why I was called the creative executive producer. <laughs> Anything to do with shots or tech technology, please don't get Jeff in the room. Right. Uh, so, You're the so, Alan Grant of comedy. You're like, what did I don't know how to. <laughs> yeah, right. So like Denny, that. Dennis had a show, a syndicated talk show that lasted six mm-hmm. months. Yeah. And he had some huge uh, commitment from Tribune Broadcasting. And, um, like three years or something. And they just cut it off, you know, at six months mm-hmm. and said, that's it. We're paying them off. And so Michael Fuchs at HBO with Brad Gray, the late great Brad Gray, uh, mm-hmm. Dennis's manager said, um, uh, you know, I would like to get him over to HBO and he can, we just like the ranting part. So we kind of designed a show uh, that fit Dennis like a glove. I mean, right. and nobody had really had the freedom to do that. Mm-hmm. The hats off to HBO for doing that. And they kind of left us alone. And, you know, that was the first time I stepped behind the camera was Dennis Miller live. I was just a, uh, a headlining comic with some, um, uh, you know, some pilot deals here and there, you know, all the development crap, you know. Yeah. And then Denny asked me, he said, look, you know, this thing's going up in flames. I don't know what's going on, but for Christ's sake, they're going to give me four and a half hours or some shit. You want to produce it with me? <laughs> wow. And I went, sure. You know, why not? So I got behind the camera. We designed this thing like a glove where he told jokes. He interviewed people that he liked. 
-hmm. He did funny picture jokes. We took calls. He did. We just played to his strength. And, and, uh, and I remember that um, two things. The first is when I first got the gig, I didn't know much about behind the camera. So I called uh, the Letterman show because mm-hmm. I knew uh, Peter LaSalle and I knew oh, uh, Morty, great. Robert Morton. I don't, I don't know Peter LaSalle, but I've heard he's like the nicest dude in show business. The best. So I call Peter and he says, here's what you do. Do only things that your host does well. That's it. Mm. Don't do anything your host can't do. If your host hits the curveball, just pitch him curveballs. End mm. of story. And I thought, that's great. And then I call Morty. And Morty was out to lunch. And I thought, that's as important, <laughs> actually. <laughs> it's like, all right, you, you still got to take lunch. You know, and I, t- I told Morty yeah. that later. And, and, you know, and then we wound up talking later. And he gave me great advice. But, but mm-hmm. I love the idea that you can't be glued to the desk or else you're going to go crazy. So right. I got great advice out of that. Flash forward, we do one episode. Mm, uh, there were some other influences in the room. Mm-hmm. Then it came back. He said, Jeff, Brown, we got to make it funny. So we just blasted jokes into the second episode. We were fortunate nice. enough to have Jim Carrey as our guest, and that was wild because he was up shooting uh, Dumb and Dumber up in the up in oh, the, wow. up in Aspen. Right, and it was a massive snowstorm, and and he was a fill-in guest. We were trying to get Brett Butler, but we the schedule. Wow, so two <laughs> days before uh, Kevin Slattery, who was phenomenal producer at all the stuff, I couldn't do. I said, we got to get a truck up to Aspen. And he said, okay. So <laughs> we got a truck through a snowstorm up to Aspen. Uh, Dennis crushes with his jokes. Jim Carrey is hilarious. Wow. We wind up winning an Emmy for that show. Wow. And, and, and the reason I tell that is because up to that point, and I know this now from 30 years of behind the camera, mm-hmm. I'm sure there was a meeting every single week between HBO execs, and Brad Gray, and probably Dennis, but at very least Brad Gray, HBO mm-hmm. saying, it's going nicely. It looks <laughs> good. Could we get a producer who has a scintilla of experience? <laughs> we get somebody behind the camera who knows what he's doing. Right. And, and we got lucky. That hit. We got a great review out of the New York Times. And within, I'm telling you, five weeks, HBO was like, we want you to do this. We want you. I became the guy who could handle uh, comedians. Wow. You know, iconoclastic comedians. I got the right. call when they were going to do the Chris Rock show. I, I just couldn't move to New York at the time because wow. that's how I, uh, that's when I wound up doing Larry Sanders. <laughs> uh, that's the only reason I didn't come to New York to try to do the Chris Rock show. But it, it can flip on a dime in show mm-hmm. business. And that was it. I, I, I guarantee you there were there were uh, there were 10 meetings every week. He's great. He can handle Dennis. But could we get somebody in who knows the nuts and bolts of how to do this? And then, boom, overnight, because we because we hit. Wow. That's the only reason we hit. And then I became the uh, comedian whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hard. I mean, that that's a great fucking role, man, because that that is hard to do. And there's not a lot of people that understand us and understand how our brains work. And it's hard. It's fucking hard to get somebody that goes and gels with those people, because otherwise you get a watered down piece of crap. And, you know, it doesn't work because I love I mean, I was I remember my parents used to watch that show all the time when I was uh, a kid. But I, hang I on, do that again and I'll do a spit take when you. Yeah, say yeah sorry. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my parents. <laughs> Your parents. <laughs> I but I was old. I think I was old. I, they used to let me it's watch whatever. True. No, it's yeah. real. Yeah. And, uh, but I, they watched it and I remember fucking, I loved comedians when I was younger, but I used to watch whatever I wanted because they didn't care. Like, I don't know. Either yeah. They weren't paying attention or whatever. That's a big key. That yeah. But that, key yeah. And that was a, that was a, that was a, now I'm doing it. That was a fucking great, uh, it, it was just a great show because he was, it, you could tell he was having fun. He was in his element. Yeah. The phone calls. Oh, that, I, I think to this day, there's no other show that does phone calls that well. No. There, no. there was one episode, man, which I don't, I think the topic was hypochondria and it was John Stewart and Dennis <laughs> and the phone calls they were getting were fucking nuts. And yeah. they, it was uh, the two of them tearing into these randos on the phone were holy. I mean, Dennis just looked overjoyed the entire yeah. time. It was, it was fucking I tell you, He's a gunslinger. Mm. When someone came loaded, mm-hmm. he brought his game up. Uh, you, you weren't hitting him in the heart. You might wing him in the shoulder and he was nailing you in the thigh. I mean, right. he was ready. Yeah, uh, just just psychologically, not from prep or anything. He just mm-hmm. had game. 
Yeah, you can tell he's it, always it thinking. Like the, well, it was like the playoffs. And um, I loved working for anybody like that. And I tried to bring that. I try to bring that to every gig mm -hmm. that I produce if I produce because I know what it's like to be on that mark out in mm -hmm. front of the camera, uh, you know, with your asshole cacking, thinking, <laughs> holy shit, right. are these jokes going to work? So I know that feeling. And my job as a producer is to make sure that person feels really comfortable out there, mm -hmm. that there's a safety net under them that we know is going to work. And then above and beyond, now they can play. Now, if they're playing, whether it's Dennis Miller or Queen Latifah, now they can play. And if, the, if, if it, they are not feeling it, mm -hmm. then boom, they can slide back into what we know is a really strong safety net. Nice. See, that's yeah. the that's the area of it that I always kind of wondered about, too, because, you know, sometimes you watch the shows that are happening now and you're like, how did they get these two people under interacting or on this fucking program? Because none of it's working. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like like the guests, yeah. don't ever, you know what I mean? It just seems like they just it, no, there's no prep. There's nothing going on. This person clearly wasn't into doing whatever the yeah. community wanted them to do. I just don't understand any of it now. Like I. Brings up two two memories of mine. The first was we took Dennis Miller live to Vegas, I think our second season. Because wow. we only did six our first season. Then we did uh, eight, maybe our second season, and then 13, some weird thing like that. Mm -hmm. And um, and we were at a casino, and you know they were asking, could we do more of a variety show thing because we're at the casino. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know... Yeah, we did. I mean, one of the reasons we won Emmys for writing was because there was nothing in between the writing and the home viewer, just right. Dennis delivering the writing. That's why yeah. we, we won. And um, so, you know, I said, Dennis, let's do it. Why not? If nothing else, we'll get a dog act. You know, <laughs> we'll get a magician. We'll just go for it. Right. And we did. And he crushed it. He was so funny. And right. then the, the smartest thing was I went, oh, wait a second. Now we can get into – now they can't keep us out of the Emmy category for best variety show because I have the episode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. And then the other thing is when you're, when you're booking guests or casting like on, on Larry Sanders, mm -hmm. um, uh, Sanders was – first of all, Gary was a genius, absolute genius. Yeah. The show was, was really his thing. You were just along for the ride. If you could get 10% of anything of yours in, you were batting a thousand wow. on that show. I mean, that's why Judd Apatow and Peter Tolan were the greatest at that because they would literally get 50 or 60% of their scripts and it was astounding. But it was Gary's life. His, it was his persona. It was amazing. And and But they would always, here's what a sort of a, little engine that could cult kind of thing. It still was, mm -hmm. was they would write and they would write and they would write. And then Sunday they would go, this baby's beautiful. Okay. We're going to shoot Friday. This thing's in perfect shape. You know, who would be great uh, to play this part? De Niro. <laughs> and then, and then by Thursday night, it was literally get me Bruno Kirby. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and, what a great name! And, and you know, luckily Bruno Kirby was fucking brilliant, and he and was, he was hilarious on those. Everything. Yeah, but it was always that you know, it, yeah. it was it was oh you know, get me Pam Stone now. I mean, it was it was always the <laughs> rush to get. We would try to shoot high, and it wow. was crazy. Yeah, I called that narrative camp for a year. I just drove <laughs> to the valley and went to work on Larry Sanders and watched how this was done. It doesn't translate much to the way they still do sitcoms, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but yeah. it, ta it taught me how to write. It taught me how to write narrative, how to write sort of dramatically, lyrically. Mm -hmm. and, and then you'll find the laughs. I, that's one of the things I loved about Larry Sanders show. And also just Gary Shanley. He seemed to take in a lot of comedians because when you look at the fucking list of people who wrote for that show, oh either who both wrote for it and then were also on it. Yeah. That, that's insane. And it would just seem like a beautiful collaboration because a lot of this, what you just said about, you know, um, how you learned to write on that show. I think every comedian that's been on it or written for it has said the same thing that he taught them. Yeah. Like, so much. Well, he started as a writer. He didn't start as a standup. Uh, you mm, know, he, he right. started as a writer. He wrote for Sanford and son, 
you know, he, he, mm -hmm. he wrote for, for other comedians. Uh, right. So he had such a respect for anybody who wrote, for anybody who wrote jokes mm -hmm. uh, and then tried to take that into other kinds of writing. So, uh, you know, he never, ever, ever threw a writer under the bus. I never saw it, wow. ever, never heard it. He had such grace with it too. I remember working with him. If you got the time, I got uh, oh yeah, dude. another uh, uh, story because I, I knew Dennis. I met Gary through Dennis because when Gary okay. would go guest host the Tonight Shows, uh, uh -huh. he would use Dennis to help him write the monologues. But in addition, he would take monologue from the Tonight Show writers. He would take monologue from um, um, Al Jean and Mike Reese, who went on to run uh, The Simpsons Forever. Mm -hmm. uh, he would take monologue from a lot of different sources because he would say, I like all they're doing is sending a list of jokes. You never know. One of them could be fantastic. We'll see. So we just get all these jokes in the pool wow. and, and then write. And Dennis was already, this is mid to late eighties. Dennis was already a star from, from SNL. But if he was in town, he would come and write with Gary. And I get a call once I'm sitting in my dopey studio city apartment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I get a call from Dennis. He goes, Jeff Brown, I'm with Gary Shanley. We're stuck on a joke. We got the setup. We don't know what the punchline is. See if he, can, he leaves a message on my machine. <laughs> I just I was doing wash or something. I came in, right. I got it. And he goes, here's the punchline. This is how long ago it was. Mm -hmm. Tammy Faye Baker uh, is getting guest hosts for her talk show because she's taking some time off. That's the setup. I'm going to have a punchline. Call me back in five. You get something later. Click. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time I hear the message, I've got two and a half minutes. Oh my God. So I can, and I'm not a like zing, you know, I'm mm -hmm. like, let me pound a little bit. So I still pounded and, and yeah. I, I called him back and I said, uh, uh, you know, they, they, um, they, they want to use uh, Joan Rivers as guest host because that way they don't have to change makeup ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so Gary loved it. Gary used the joke and he said, Dennis, next time bring Jeff in. So oh. that's how I got to know. It's amazing how, you know, there's so much crap in Hollywood and merit is always involved, but it's, it doesn't all of it often seem to be number one on the list of, mm -hmm. of, of requirements, but I can really look back and go, God damn, I got really far just being able to craft a pretty good joke. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, so that's how I got to know him. That's how I got to know Gary. That's, that's incredible, dude, because you were on the, uh, <laughs> you know, antenna TV runs this night show coincidentally. Yeah. Oh, that's your, right. Your episode was on last night, but I think it was, it wasn't the first time you were on it. I think cause they, Carson said, welcome back. You had one of the best jokes. Uh, that I've heard, and I'm sure you remember it. I'll see if you do about Maybe breakfast. Not. I'm 103. A, what a is bre it? breakfast? We remember you talking about the sizes of breakfasts going up. Oh, he man, <laughs> yeah. Fucking, <laughs> but the bed, the punch line. You said uh, you're talking about the like 86 flapjacks, he man. You know, yeah. and you said uh, you go. Oh God, I hope I don't butcher it. You said uh, the only way you go, the only way that works is if you've got a if you parked a tractor in the parking lot and you're pedaling it out. <laughs> that's, the <laughs> only, that, that's the only way that breakfast makes sense. Yeah, I yeah. Was, I remember I was, that premise because it used to piss me off, especially being from Wisconsin. Everybody's coming up with farmers breakfasts and he man breakfasts. Yeah. <laughs> and you go, and you know. Farmers need that because mm -hmm. they've been up since four <laughs> working. <laughs> you know, you checked your phone messages and then ambled over to Denny's. I don't yeah. think you need the <laughs> union breakfast. All right. Was that so? Did you meet Dennis during stand up? Was that it? You guys yes. are stand up buddies? Out here, and we realized we became fast friends. We were just the two sides of the same coin. I was a little, uh, uh, you know, a little nicer, a little more mainstream, but, mm. uh, and Dennis was a little edgier, but we were kind of two sides of the same. We wrote the same way. We wow. attacked, uh, jokes the same way. And, uh, and, you know, I was edgier than people thought I was. And mm -hmm. Dennis was actually quite frankly, uh, more accepting than, than people tended to think he was on stage when he was doing a headline set. Right. So we just made fast friends. I'll never forget. We were at a club out in the Valley, I can't remember the name of it, but um, we had finally gotten halfway decent sets. This is 84. We were both mm -hmm. in town for 10 minutes. 
and uh, and we're set. <laughs> like I'm doing eleven fifteen, and he's doing eleven twenty five, something like that. Right, comedy cabaret, I think it was called. Oh my god! And uh, eleven thirteen. Skip Stevenson walks in. Now he was huge at the time. This is the <laughs> mid eighties, right? Massive off of whatever the hell show he was. I can't remember the thing he did with Byron Allen and he, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It was like a huge hit, and and was not afraid to imbibe a lot of illicit drugs before he went on stage. But I mean, <laughs> he was at the level right then, nineteen eighty four, where where oh my god, Skip Stevenson is here clear out he's going <laughs> right on stage <laughs> so, <laughs> so he goes on stage does like an hour and 20 minutes it's mm -hmm. 1 a.m wow. he's killing he's crushing mm -hmm. dennis is in the back of the room with me and we're you know we're we're uh irritated to say the yeah. least yeah so he's leaning over in my ear the entire hour and 20 minutes. And Dennis is brilliant off the top of his head. Mm -hmm. and, and he's just lasering Skip Stevenson. <laughs> and I think I saw that joke with the original cast. Uh, you know, he's just, <laughs> just hammering him. And then here's where I knew I would, I would love Dennis Miller forever. Mm -hmm. Skip Stevenson finishes, walks mm -hmm. up stage. Everyone in the crowd, whew, women just following him out into the bar. The guys following him. There's seven people left in the room. The room wow. was packed. Seven people left. Dennis goes up. That's right. Dennis was on first. Dennis goes up, mm -hmm. does every single thing he told me in the back of the room <laughs> on stage. No fucking way. And Holy I went up the balls on this dude. I oh love this guy. Oh, my God. And so we remained fast friends and wound up with the same agency before Dennis hit. And, uh, Wow. And we would co-headline and things like that and just had a blast. We had a blast. It's great. That's that's fucking awesome. Yeah. Wh who was uh, like your your class? Who did you come up with? Like, where was your main club? Was it the improv? Yeah. Uh, you know, I worked the store and I okay. became a paid regular at the store. I, I got to town uh, 83. So it was right after they'd had that big blowout in the late 70s with the, you know, if you had the history of comedy in L.A. where they had, you know, essentially a strike. Uh, yeah. at the clubs and uh, you know that was all the Shandlings and Letterman's and Leno's right. of the world and that dust had settled somewhat when I got to town but okay. it was still essentially you're going to wind up doing one or the other they didn't mm -hmm. like you doing either of the rooms but I tried to do both rooms as much as I could and then I was just getting better spots at the improv I really mm -hmm. liked the store I liked I like playing there. I liked seeing a lot of comics there. I saw Pryor there, for God's sake. I mean, you know, I just fallen off the the turnip truck, and right. I'm in the back of the <laughs> back of the original room at the comedy store. And Richard Pryor's going on stage to, to put together material for his second uh, special, Incredible. and his first was the most amazing comedy special of all time, live, live and in yeah. concert. Yeah, and and. And I'm watching him and he goes up to a standing ovation. He gets a standing ovation on his way up to the stage. Doesn't get a laugh for 20 minutes because it's all new material. Right. And he wrote on stage. Not a, lot, not a lot of guys can really do that. He did it. Mm. And he wrote on stage and he stopped at 20 minutes and he said, you know, I know y'all want me to do the drunk. I'm not doing the drunk. <laughs> I got another motherfucking special in seven fucking weeks. <laughs> and he just went back to pounding new shit. Wow. And I went, holy crap. It was just all about learning about the balls to do the job. I yeah. remember Michael Keaton, who a lot of people don't know was a stand-up. Yeah. Br brilliant stand-up. Mm -hmm. he's going I, you know again i'm just there like my third week there like i can't believe i'm getting to see them <laughs> so i'm backstage they're about to introduce keaton there's a table you know and it's midweek so they're getting uh you know salesmen on the road from the hyatt next door which is you know it's, it's two guys sitting here just pounding drinks and talking yeah. to each other about yeah i had a bad flight and oh man they tried to take my luggage when i and whatever and, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and he had just gotten a show with uh, Jim Belushi, a sitcom. Can't remember oh, yeah, the hell yeah, it was. Yeah. I remember that one uh, <laughs> rerun, in reruns, but I yeah, remember. Uh, exactly. I can't remember what it was. But so the intro is all like, hey, he just got a big network sitcom deal. Please welcome Michael Keaton. Mm -hmm. He walks around me. I didn't even know he was there. Walks around me, goes on stage, does a full seven minutes on these two motherfuckers. Not talking to them. <laughs> just remembering snippets of their conversation. That's great. And putting them in like dramatic settings. And shit. And I'm like, how do you do that? It was so, wow. it was it was school. 
And that's at the store? Favorite. That was at the store. Wow. I did the same thing at the improv. I just got to see guys work. And you could see why they were the comics they were. Mm -hmm. I remember watching Bill Maher one night. And there's 25 people in the room at the improv. Right. And uh, do you remember Dennis Blair? Great yeah. uh, guitar yes. comedian. Open for Rodney oh, yeah. forever. Absolutely. Uh, Dennis is in the little hallway in the L.A. improv. Right. He's just very lightly tuning up, making it, you know, making sure he's ready for a set. He's following Bill very mm -hmm. lightly. And so I go in and I, I watch. You can't even hear. I, I, I'm watching Bill and Bill's pounding material in, in that great sort of arrogant way that Bill has that he can mm -hmm. pull off. And here's why he can pull it off, because that's who he is. He's yeah. on stage. He stops mid joke mm -hmm. and he goes, what is that? <laughs> and he hears <laughs> The, the, the slightest slight guitar, the slightest, <laughs> it's, it's from Palm Springs. You can barely hear it. <laughs> and the, the manager of the room goes, uh, uh, that's uh, the next act, Dennis Blair. He's, he's uh, warming up in the hallway. And Bill just goes, well, tell him to shut the fuck up. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> and I went, oh, I get why all of Bill's stuff works because it is right. completely organic to yeah. who he is. Yeah. That's fucking hilarious. What was it? Would you say there? I mean, I've heard differences from different people about the comedy store and the improv. Almost like the, the improv was where the po almost like the really polished guys, TV guys kind of went. And the comedy store was more of the, you know, had more of like a riffraff kind of. Um, uh, I can't think. Would you say that that was how it stayed? Or do you think it was what they, they both kind of wound up running the same course? You know, I, th I would say this, first of all, for me, the difference was in approach to comedy. I think Mitzi liked big hook acts. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were a brilliant writer inside of that, that's how, as a monologist, you, you got on mm -hmm. uh, there. Uh, Bud Friedman at the Improv just sort of had New York inside of him. Yeah. He liked uh, comics who went up and told jokes, men, women, whoever. He liked joke telling. He liked uh, monology at the core of it. Mitzi liked a, a personality. And you can see it in the comics that came out of the store and hit, mm -hmm. whether, it was, uh, w whether it was Gary, whether it was uh, Robin Williams, Jim yeah. Carrey, larger than life. Larger than life had something that was larger than life, whereas the comics out of out of this out of uh, the improv were your, were your string of monologists was the Jay Leno, and and the uh, Jerry Seinfeld and the Larry Millers and the Carol Leafers of the world. Yeah. That's the way I saw it, and I didn't feel I had a personality necessarily big enough. I mean, there were there were. There were straight monologists who were working the store, and I always liked working there. But you could see what she loved and what she liked to push. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that to me was the difference in the rooms. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, divide it any other way because there were unbelievable comics working both rooms. Yeah, that's and and that's the thing. That's the coolest thing is that there's so many big acts. But I know just from reading about it or whatever, there was kind of a contentious nature about sometimes who could play where and why. And, you know, I mean, it seemed like those are the two clubs that mattered. And like, you know, there was the laugh factory. I don't I don't know when that actually came into play, but it was never really a threat to either club. Right. So nobody nobody paid it any. Well, you know, I think I think what happened then was as the store and the improv, as all of that dust settled mm -hmm. and people left and, uh, you know, aged out <laughs> from both management and comedy side, all of that kind of went away. And then it okay. was just about getting stage time. And now. Uh, the folks who run the comedy store and the folks who run the improv are the equivalent of Billy Bean up with the Oakland athletics. It's all about the analytics. It's like, mm. let's make this work. Yeah. Let's get people yeah. in who can bring an audience. Then let's put shows together. Then let's create an internet presence. Then mm -hmm. let's do social media. It, it, I don't believe there's anything left. No. Of, of blood between those two. They're just businesses trying to make it in an ever changing performance world and you can see it by the amazing lineups both of those clubs feature yeah and uh, you know i'm astounded by by the comics who are coming up you know mm -hmm. and the generation that followed me you know J just great comics you just look at it you go wow yeah. 
that's just straight, straight on good comedy. And well, so I would see a show at both of those rooms right now. Yeah. And when I, quite frankly, the Laugh Factory, not to leave them out, became right. a force, became yes. a real force because guys weren't getting the spots. The scene was growing and mm -hmm. needed another club. Yeah. You know, and then all of a sudden, Dane Cook's popping over it over there. You know, Chris D'Elia's popping over there. Mm -hmm. You know, Whitney Cummings is popping over there. You know, and and they built that. You know, and then Dom Irera was like, well, they're going to give me a lot more room to run yeah. at, at the Laugh Factory. So Jamie Masada really s smartly took advantage of that and really became a player, a strong, strong player in L.A. Yeah, Dom's got Dom used to have a show out of out of uh, yeah. Laugh Factory, didn't he? For a while, I loved yeah. that. I loved watching that when he had it there. I actually um, wrote a brand new joke with Dom as the punchline. I'm not sure quite how to do it yet, but I'm. Oh no! Way. The, the joke is at the. I'm at the age where, uh, when I go to the doctor, uh, he he winds up sounding like Dom Irera. It's literally <laughs> like, Doc, I got I got like a little growth on one of my toes or something. Should I do something about it? What do you want to do something about it for? Is it bothering you? No, then don't do anything about it. What are you going to go to a hospital? Those places have death traps. Buddy of mine just went to the hospital. Three minutes later, dead. And he was just dropping somebody off. Don't do it. No. Has he heard it yet? No, no, I haven't done it anywhere. I, oh, okay. I got to oh work my on my God. dom a little bit. I got to get a little lower, yeah. a little more jolly. Oh, but I, I love the idea that, that a doctor a actually winds jolly. up sounding like Dom Irera. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that's fucking genius. I love he he got me into the Laugh Factory in Chicago. He was very nice to me when I started when I was younger because I and I Great only time. think it's because I opened for him for the first time at Governor's and we uh, oh. I don't know if the show was like. That's a something was going there, on. Baby. What'd you say? That's a baptism there, Governor's Long Island. Oh, I know, man. That was my, I think that was my first time, one of my first times there. It's first or second time there. First time there, I opened for Joe Starr. I don't know if he, uh, he's a great, know, great guy. Um, but uh, Dom was the second time I was there. And that was, again, like, it's a tough fucking room. But when you do well there, you feel, you just feel good. Oh, yeah. So I, but he and I bonded. Of course, after after he, once he, I feel like once a comic, especially if his statue realizes you're funny, then you're kind of in that way. But then, yeah. then before the next show, we're watching TV in the green room. I don't know. It was like channel 13, whatever those channels are that play yeah. shit. And uh, uh, Jay and the Americans, the, the actual, you know, Jay Black wow. is on TV, old as shit, but can still sing. And he and I start bonding over music because I, I love all the old, you know, music yeah. and stuff like that too, just because my parents, my mother mostly or whatever. And then we started bonding. Over that. So we started bonding over music. And then a Beatles thing came on and he's a huge Beatles fan. So I'm rolling out, wow. you know, names of Beatles shit. And then we just bonded over that. And then that was it. That's fantastic. So, well, go, yeah, and, you know, when you bond at a place like Governor's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the, that's the one place I've worked in the entire country where it was super loud. Mm. And nobody was heckling. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just loud. People go, yeah, I'm looking for a good time tonight. It's going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what do you need? Though? What do you got? You know, another table. I'll take this. In. It was just loud. Yep. And, and, and then if you got off even moderately wrong, mm -hmm. it was just they smell blood. You know, it oh. was literally like, um, okay, from one of your first gigs, Jeff, we're going to uh, put you in the ring with Marvin Hagler. You okay with that? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's, it's, uh, that is a, that is another coincidental name that just popped up because I'm watching this thing on late night. Right. And uh, it's on CNN. They're doing some whole, the whole big late night thing, the Carson Letterman Leno oh, yeah, thing, yeah. and then Conan and John Stewart, whatever, but they're going through all that shit. And uh, I guess the, the episode that made Leno was when he had, um oh Hugh Grant uh, Hugh Grant on and the only thing I mean again I was too I, I don't know what was going on then right so I didn't actually see that episode but I do remember a Bill Maher joke about Hugh Grant or whatever and he said uh <laughs> and he was talking about men and women and how it's only the difference between old and new and he said Hugh Grant had Elizabeth Hurley at home and he wanted Marvin Hagler in a wig and then <laughs> Thing I could think of when that segment came up and yeah. you just fucking said Marvin Hagler. Oh, that's amazing. Bill has the greatest. I, I'll, I'll never forget a joke he did that used to kill me about. How do you, you know, gay, gay has to be born. I, I'm butchering the setup, but, mm. you know, gay has to be a natural thing because do you choose that? Do, does somebody actually, does a good looking guy actually wake up, look in the mirror and go, well, I'm not wasting this on chicks. <laughs> <laughs> 
Such a great show. Oh, but, yeah. I mean, and jokes like that will pop in. Now, so, you know, I used to be a musician. So if oh wow, <laughs> I used to play drums. A uh, drums? What made you get? Was that something you wanted to do before comedy? Yeah, I All actually right. did it and made. Uh, you know, I moved into comedy because it was more stable. Put it that way. Okay. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit, that's crazy. That's yeah, so. Yeah. How long were you doing the drumming thing before you became a comic? Well, I played mostly. I wanted to play mostly congas and Latin hand percussion wow. with all sorts of you know, Latin bands and blues bands and things like that uh, in the how Midwest. Easy, how hard was that to break into? Um, you know, not that hard because, well, there was, there was a ridiculous fertile music scene in the upper Midwest, Minneapolis, everybody knows because uh, mm -hmm. the Prince, but even prior to that, Minneapolis and uh, Madison, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Steve Miller band came out of there, Boss yeah. Gags, uh, you know, a lot of, and, and then Chicago, of course. So I grew up in mm -hmm. commercial Wisconsin. So, you know, and I went to school in Madison. So, uh, so, you know, and even the public school music systems were like crazy good back then. I mean, like, you know, the chief oboist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra is from Kenosha, you know, right. you go, how, how did that happen? The right. two top call jazz trumpet players in LA right now are, are still two dudes from Kenosha. Wow. Uh, you know, so they just had a great scene. So I got in with that way and I was, I was halfway decent, but I could tell as a drummer, you know, I was, I wasn't going to cut it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as a trap drummer. Cause it was a four way coordination was, you know, and then they said, Hey, why don't you sing? And I went, are you fucking kidding me? I'll kill myself. <laughs> Try to sing and play drums at the same time. I'll literally tie my throat in a net. Right. So I settled on, um, I had always been drawn to Congress and Latin hand percussion. Mm -hmm. And then I just started playing and I got gigs up in, I moved to Minneapolis to do stand up, but I also started getting gigs. So That's I did incredible. that for a while and I wound up doing some studio work and stuff like that. And um, I had a blast. Wow. So there literally isn't a period of your life, of your adult life where you have been on stage performing something that's true that is wow. really true i love yeah. that man that's fucking incredible did you have it actually did you ever have day jobs or were you just straight out of you know uh yeah pre no engine? and uh, you know i was i was a writer i started as a sports writer but facts mm. would get in the way i could not you know i could barely get the score right so you know oh, wait that's right <laughs> you know? hold on a sec the, the tonight yeah. show thing you were plugging uh, you were plugging a sports show you were doing, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. On CBS. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. That was my pilot. That that wow. um, uh, my pilot. Here's 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 how here's how showbiz can go. My pilot, uh, which was sports, they were trying to get sports highlights into prime mm -hmm. time, but they wanted it to be funny. Uh, and okay. so we so we did a whole show with correspondence and everything. And my pilot and Seinfeld's pilot premiered the same week. Oh and, uh, my God. <laughs> and wow. we went off the air right after the pilot. <laughs> and Seinfeld went like that. <laughs> Holy shit. That's we literally funny. had uh, Don Olmeyer, who was a great sports producer mm -hmm. back in the 80s and 90s. He was the dude, you know? Yeah. So they said, How can this go wrong? We got Don, Don Olmeyer's executive producer. So we had designed an entire uh, pilot. Uh, and Richard Crystal, Billy's brother, was the executive producer. So wow. it was him and me just jamming and doing sports jokes and stuff like that. And we had like we had Larry um, um, Larry Amaros was oh, one wow. of the correspondents. This is way prior to anybody being you know openly gay. But we had right. Larry Larry do reviews of the uniforms of. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So we just did crazy <laughs> shit. It was really, and we had Kareem Abdul Jabbar come on, and he wow. was in the green room, and you moved the camera, and there was the green room right there. He's literally just <laughs> off camera, I, and it was great fun. And uh, and and we had it set up to be like what Letterman was doing at the time. This is ninety ninety one, where he would take the camera up into the offices mm -hmm. and do all the funny shit in the offices. So right. the premise was we didn't have the money to compete with ESPN. Uh, oh, it was called wow. Sports Comedy Network. That's what it was called. Sports That's Comedy genius, Network. though. And, and it was great. And we had it all set. And literally, literally the 11th hour, 11 p.m. the night before we're shooting, Don Olmeyer comes in literally for the first time. Oh my and he God. says, he's, and Don Olmeyer was, he had a piece of pizza in one hand, a cigarette and a bourbon in the other. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> and he goes, so what do you guys got going? Oh, no, no, no. We can't do any of that. That's not going to work. That's not going to fly. Here's what we got to do. And he changed the whole thing before, before oh, we literally had to work all night and then shoot the next day. Wow. 
And he turned it into like I was sort of supposed to be in a sport coat and tie behind a desk kind of thing. Right. And it never, it never gelled. So I feel like sports comedy shows don't always, except for, except for, uh, um, you know, what's the, what's the one with, uh, it's a Benson, um, guy. I can't think of his name, Richard. Uh, God, what's the sports show? The comedy show. That was really good. Arliss. No, not Arliss. Uh, was Arliss. Ar- no. Um, uh, um, yeah. Coach. Uh, nope. Oh, I love, no, no, no. Coach was great, but the guy, the, the, the one that was like inside co- like comedy sports, basically it was, um, turned into yeah. a game show. I'm, 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 I'm I know. I know. I feel like the, yeah. This is, this is a game show. This is the part <laughs> and, we cut and, out and nobody's buying it because <laughs> someone can come up with the answer. <laughs> Wait, who, who, here, here, let me, guy? let me give you your worst nightmare. Why don't you go back and work on a little bit more, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this is going to drive me crazy. What Are was you the, talking about? The, the Aaron Sorkin one? Uh, yes, sport. that's it. Thank you. Yeah. That was huge. That was like a cult following type sports of thing. Night, then, I think it was called Sports Night. Night. That was probably yeah. it. Okay, yeah, Sports Night. Is the guy? This was it. The guy who played Benson. I can't think of his fucking name. No, Robert um, Guillaume. He was Robert Guillaume guy. was in it. Yeah, yeah, he was in it. That. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was great. I, uh, in it. Uh, Peter. Uh, uh, great actor from a six feet under Peter Crosby. Oh yeah. He was, yeah. He was great was in, yeah. And that's the only things I remember. I remember that one. And I remember the one that Norm had for half a second on comedy central. Yeah, that was, a, a good that one. was good. That was yeah. solid. Cause Norm was, just has the right touch. He's fucking, he's so he's hilarious. ridiculous. Yeah. That yeah. guy cracks me up. I, I've never met him. I think he'd hate me, but I love Norm. So I don't care. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, don't think he would. <laughs> I don't know if he would or not. I, I just, you, you know, you ever have, I don't know. I have that feeling. I just like sometimes like guys that I really like that are in stand up who have been, you know, around for fucking ever. I just go, oh, man, it'd be so exciting to meet him. And then my brain goes, no, he'd hate you. <laughs> no, I mean, you can't go there. Wow. You are. You know, uh, let me see. Let me let me see. Big Italian family. Yes. Yeah. yeah a lot of a lot, a lot of weird family reunions. Yep. <laughs> yeah. A lot of That's- extrapolating out. I shouldn't do this. But if I did that, maybe I would do that. Yes. And then there won't be a fight. Yes. And then you're, yeah. Okay. Ex- exactly. That's that exactly it. Why. Don't do that anymore. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. You have a comedy it. or a drummer. People, he could be a yeah. therapist. <laughs> People will either like you or they won't. And that's just part of comedy and part of life. Yeah. And it, it, I, I'll tell you that and this is, this is the God's honest truth. It's a true anecdote. And I wound up doing it uh, uh, on a couple of uh, talk shows and they loved it. And they said, yeah, so I, it's on the album. It's on mm-hmm. uh, what were you think. What was I thinking? Um, the first time I meet Rodney Dangerfield oh. is at the improv in LA. Mm-hmm. I'm, li- I'm literally there uh, literally a month. I'm in LA mm-hmm. and I had just worked with Jerry Seinfeld on the road and he liked me and I see him at the improv and he goes, Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, right then Rodney pulls up in a limo blows right through everybody because it's that classic you know Mm -hmm. part the seas we got a famous person boom right on stage he goes on stage he kills for an hour and jerry's out with me and they're just in the restaurant and he goes would you like to meet rodney and i go yeah i'd love to meet rodney are you kidding me that would be a thrill of a lifetime as rodney's coming out jerry knows rodney from new york they're good friends jerry's already uh, you know an -hmm. established big time talk show comedian so he actually can stop Rodney. Right. And he stops Rodney right at the door. The doors are open. His limo's right there. He, stay, he goes, uh, Rodney, I'd like you to meet a young comedian friend of mine, uh, Jeff Cesario. And Dangerfield, I swear to you, goes, Cesario, huh? Italian, huh? Stick to the tumbling. Boom, right out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's fucking great the great. greatest story I've ever, shit. Had, I ever had in show business wow that's fucking amazing he i i, I talked about him a bunch on the show and he i wish i could have met him as a comic or a, not a comic yeah. i think he's the greatest he he seemed like such a cool dude and super sweet to comics too apparently yeah yeah, he was a, he was yeah, just an unbelievable comic. My God. There was a couple comics that told me that he would just pay like he he loved comedians so much that like even if he didn't use a joke you wrote for him, he'd buy it from because he, he loved comics that he would like he knew it would buy food or rent or like. Yeah, it's those like, guys. That's the same with Gary. Like I was telling you, he would he would take jokes from virtually anybody. And I remember thinking once and saying once, now, why would you want to joke, you know, list of jokes from that guy? Cause he would go, hey, you know, first of all, you never know. And secondly, 
it, it's just a muscle. Let them exercise the muscle and, and wow. or it might spark something in you or me or Dennis, you know, and I went, oh, I got it. Respect the respect the written word. Just just go. For yeah. It. And, and, you know, that was back in the day where you could slap 20 jokes together in a day and right. nobody was going to go. And I think joke 13 and 17 are particularly weak. You know, <laughs> like, guys understood, you know, yeah. you're, you're throwing spaghetti against the wall. Yeah, there was I, I got to write for uh, a few different comedians or whatever. And I remember one of them. It was it was kind of like that process. It was a bit of a hell gig either way. But um, I remember I was uh, I got offered to do the gig. It was like a VH1 thing. And they sent this large packet. And then I did the I, mean, I was so eager to write to, to get to write for the first time for somebody else for a, a TV thing that I that I'd watched anyway. So, you know, it was 45 pages, this packet, and you had to watch all the videos. And it was for. Um, yeah. I love the 90s R&B, which, by the way, huge R&B guy. Not really. Uh, but like, <laughs> but again, it was, it, was, it was whatever it was. And I remember being at my day job um, at a beach in, like, the front gate to, like, let people in or whatever. I remember getting down to where it was close to dead, put somebody else at the window, and I just fucking sat there and then wrote jokes and watched these videos on my phone. Wow, yeah. Bang. Yeah, and it was so great. But I remember the same thing where, like, after that, when I was writing jokes – for them, it was cool to see how they just needed the idea or the meat and potatoes of an idea. Or sometimes, like, I loved when they took a whole joke from me. What I thought was cooler is when they would take pieces of something and then I could see them turn into something else. It was, it was mind-blowing. Yeah, Gary was amazing at that. And also, Dennis was really good. Dennis Miller was great at... Because people tried to write Dennis Miller jokes. Mm -hmm. And he said once, don't write a Dennis Miller joke. Write a joke. Wow. I'll make it a Dennis Miller joke. Don't wow. worry about that. I got that part. Just write right. a good joke. <laughs> and, and it's so unbelievably true. That is so true. And, That's incredible. And even non-comics, when I um, worked for, I, I wrote on Queen Latifah's daytime show, which lasted like two seasons. Oh, wow. Wound up being head writer on it for the second season. Nice. And uh, I'll never forget, um, you know, and I hadn't done a lot of stand-up you know, mm. in the several years prior to that. And um, she sat down and she's, you know, cause they were like, and, and first of all, daytime television, you think nighttime, you think late night TV's cutthroat daytime, fucking forget it. Really? Stab you right in the front. Wow. There is too much money at stake. It's unbelievable. Wow. There's a studio involved. There's advertising groups involved. There's specific advertisers involved. There's producers. It's a, um, there's Holy nine, shit. There's nine, uh, uh, you know, agendas in the room and mm -hmm. you have to serve all, try to serve all of them. It's crazy. And I learned on daytime because they wanted to, they, yeah, that we, we brought, they brought me in and Robin Thede, who's now a black lady sketch show. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, they, they brought in like all late night people who had, uh, a Beth Sherman who had worked on, all, you know, all kinds of shows and they brought us in specifically. We want the monologue to sound late night. And oh, then of course wow. we get in and we write late night jokes and right. they go, yeah, we can't do any of those. <laughs> <laughs> and we finally broke it down to a formula. A normal joke is set up punchline. Mm -hmm. For daytime television, unless you're Ellen, it has to be <laughs> set up information, takeaway punchline. And you go, wow. well, by the time you get to the punchline, it, yes, by the time you get to the punchline, there's no joke. But first of all, Latifah, unbelievably funny, unbelievably mm -hmm. hilarious. Wow. Such a great human being. And, you know, talk about musicians. She had that sense of humor. She would go uh. blue and weird on you in a heartbeat. <laughs> she would have unbelievably crazy fucking anecdotes from the road. She is so funny. And she said this in our first meeting. She said, I don't want to do a monologue because I have too much respect for what you guys do. So wow. let's let's do it more like Carol Burnett. Where, you know, we'll set something up and somebody could come in. You guys can play the characters or we'll go out. I love the old Carabinette show. And we wound up actually getting Tim Conway and getting uh, Fred Willard and oh getting Vicki Lawrence. It was wow. so great to write for wow. those people. It was so much fun. But so even someone like Latifi, you go, all right, I I'm clearly writing for this person. I'd write for her for free at this point. Because right. she gets it. She, yeah. she fucking gets it, you know. That's incredible. I didn't realize cut TV, uh, daytime TV was just that oh cutthroat, though. God. 
Yeah. They don't and they had us it. producing daytime segments and we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. It was like, okay, we're going to do a, a, a little comedy segment and then we have to, we have to give away shoes. And you go, what? <laughs> <laughs> so the best we could do, the best we came up with was shoes or lose. That was the name of the game. <laughs> oh my God. That's great. <laughs> it was the greatest. It's, it's gotta be a movie at some point, but uh, you know, right. if I get to it, it's too funny. What do you think the difference is between the Ellen? Is it because Ellen's a stand-up and they've yeah. got that kind of unique kind of okay? Ellen's a stand-up is... and a killer stand-up. I yes. mean, unbelievable stand-up comedian. Yeah, and paid her. I mean, I worked with her a couple times on the road where where you know we just shot the shit and uh, you know she's she's she knows the craft and she's yeah. got it now. and she has her thing. Mm -hmm. She has that thing, man. It's so great. Yeah. That, that tone where she can play it straight. And then all of a sudden she just, she cuts you and she roll blocks you at the knees and yeah. you don't see it coming. <laughs> She's fucking yeah. amazing at that. Her but, last special was so fucking good. Oh, I yeah. mean, for somebody who'd been away for 20 something years, you know, yeah. and then just to come back with a special like that and knock it out of the park, which is, I mean, there's guys, I know I, I'm not even going to say his name on the thing, but uh, there's a, of somebody who's relatively famous who went away, did TV and came back with another special after not doing one since like 2004 fucking sucked. It was so, it was such it's a shame. So hard. That is such a tough muscle to keep in shape, mm -hmm. but you know, I mean, the same with Steve Harvey. He just crushes it when he yeah. goes back to stand up because we, we came up in a time and I, and I know it's different now. I believe mm -hmm. you yeah. can actually tell me, but from the young comics I've dealt with and talked with and, and hung out with, it's different. It's just a different vibe now. Thank God it's growing. It's becoming something else. But when I came up, whether you were Ellen or you were me or, or you were, you, you know, um, 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 Steve Harvey, when you walked into a green room somewhere, mm -hmm. the first thing in your head was, I, I, I'm as funny as every one of these motherfuckers. <laughs> that you had to have that mindset. Yep. Yep. Well, you just didn't work. Right. You didn't work. I mean, you know, the, the measuring stick back then was opener, middle, headliner. And if you got to headliner, you had to keep going. You had to go, all right, maybe not on my, you know, maybe only once out of 10 times am I going to get, uh, am I going to get up on the level of a Robin Williams? But do I think I can? Yeah, you fucking right. right I do. You know, it is, yeah. it is kind of like that uh, to an extent, though, too, except the headliners don't seem to leave anymore. So, like, we're, it's like we just keep piling up, like, <laughs> they they stop work they stop writing you know and then all of a sudden it's like when i when i started the uh i feel it's like, like the locks on the saint lawrence seaway they just shut them <laughs> <laughs> and now there's a big whale in there swimming against the wall yes and there's all these other young whales trying to oh. get through Oh Absolutely. My God. Hey, listen, I'll be that kid That's who stands harsh. on the reef trying to get, you know, Richie Byrne to jump over the I don't care. I'll do it. I don't give a fuck. Wow. Um but it is it is hilarious because like when I started, it was like I, you know, I loved comedy, huge comedy nerd, even from when I was in high school. I had Franklin uh Hughes book, um uh Comic Insights, loved reading that stuff. Um Who's book I, was that? Franklin Ajay. Is it Ajay, oh. Ajay or Ajay? Yeah. Oh my god, the best. Ajay. The best. Yeah. I got the to best. open for him and I was, st I was like floored. The best. the best guy. Yeah. The best guy and the best writer. Uh, he's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I got into stand up from watching oh, wow. him. He talk about being 14 or 15 watching mm -hmm. the tonight show. Yes. And I went, even at 15, I went, who is this guy? Right. Where does he get the balls to yeah. take that much time with each fucking joke? Because he knew mm -hmm. I got a left hook. At the end of every one of these fucking jokes. Yeah. And I ain't going to rush it. This yep. is my temple. I'll exactly. never forget. This is long before Tiger Woods. One of the jokes that said, I have to do stand up was he went on the Tonight Show and fucking Carson loved him. Mm -hmm. And he would get on Tonight Show and, and he, he did this joke. He said, um, If I had to uh, uh, get a black man into a sport right now, I would choose golf. I would like to see a black man do golf and add the element of speed to the game. <laughs> <laughs> that line, I said, oh, my God. It just blew wow. my mind. I said, I got I to gotta try to do stand-up. That's I incredible. I can't. I, I, he was, I, that's how I always felt about stand-up, though. Is I remember going to stand-up shows. Mm-hmm. 
And before I got into stand up and thinking, I, I, I am in the wrong spot. I, I would leave. I would have to leave. I would get so full of agita. Yeah. I would, I'd say, I, I, I'm, I'm not supposed to be sitting watching this. I'm supposed to be up there doing it. Yeah. It's yeah. a weird, it, it is that kind of feeling. I never, I hadn't gone to a club when I was younger. I never got to go to any kind of stand up club. I got to see, um, I think in high school, I went to see Richard Jenny. Um, at uh god i think it was trump plaza at the time or whatever it was an ac i i brought a friend i was fucking i mean i think i almost fell out of my chair doubled over in pain laughing yeah maybe just, the best pure club comic yes who ever lived him and Atel. oh yeah 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 absolutely it's just boy to watch rich work in a club and you'd go he'd go on stage and he'd have a set yeah, Rich would do. Rich was the first guy who did two, three, four hours just because he wanted to. Right, he wasn't setting a record. Right, he was. Yeah, he was so good. He was I almost got so into an good. accident because I was listening. I had a, I had a CD. Um, I did. I was cry. I, I laughed so hard as me and one of my close friends, and we were dating uh, my girlfriend at the time. He was dating my girlfriend's sister. So he and I drove back in a separate car for some reason, and I was like. I had a bunch of comedy. They CDs. were ditching you. That's why you drove back. <laughs> I think that I was going to say, I'm pretty sure we all went to see like some outdoor dumb play. And then we were like, this is fucking dumb. We were like, we should probably be fucking, but these idiots have to put on a play in the summer outside. And be ruining it for us. That's what they said about Shakespeare. Let's get out of here. Put in some dumb fucking play outside. <laughs> <laughs> let's get laid let's go into they're town like, and I'm have some die. mead and get laid yeah exactly they're like i'm only living to 30 i i guys should be i should be back at home <laughs> this is bullshit <laughs> gotta keep this moving yeah jesus that's three minutes to hook me shakespeare <laughs> or i'm out exactly. i gotta get laid i got the black plague i, I can tell i, I gave up <laughs> i gave up cattle for this um i don't even know if they did that back then but i figured i'd throw in a dowry reference <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we were, we were in the car and I had a Richard Jenny CD and I had an Eddie Murphy CD and Richard Jenny's was his greatest bits. And the fret dude, I mean, crying. Yeah. And I almost, we almost hit another fucking car. That's I couldn't stop laughing. Yeah. Um, I love the bit he used to do on, uh, you know, you're on the road too long when you're sitting up in a hotel room at 3 a.m. watching cartoons on TV. You, you go and, uh, you know, this, uh, Wilma Flintstone's got a hell of a caboose on her. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I caboose. That one. Caboose. Yeah, caboose, caboose, such uh, a great. He was so great. One of my favorite bits Rest of his peace, was right. um when he would do the how men and women should put the all their cards out on the table, and he was like, "I'm Susan, I'm an Aries." And then she puts the card mm -hmm. down. And he's like, yeah. and, he, and it keeps getting crazier and crazier. Yeah. By the end of it, it's like, uh, uh, I think we should see other people. I am other people. <laughs> <laughs> just throws all the cards down. It was just fucking great. But, he and I and Larry Miller and Carol Leifer were what I used to call the spotlight stormtroopers. There was an agency <laughs> in New York called the spotlight agency. And these guys were the last guys to learn booking from the mob. So wow. they would, they could literally get you. Get, so they got Leno and then they got Seinfeld and they got rise. They got Ed Miller. They got everybody big in the, in the mid to late eighties. Wow. And, and they would get gigs on wrong numbers. I swear to God. <laughs> they would do literally by hello oh, holiday in Saskatoon. No, we don't have a comedy room, sir. We don't. Well, yes, we have a banquet room, but that's not what. Of course, there's a room divider in it in case we need to run to. Well, yes, we have a follow spot. What good hotel? Would... You know what? Just send the fucking comics. Send the comics, and we'll do a show. <laughs> oh my god, that's so, where my manager works. First four, the first four through mm -hmm. were, were always. It was Larry Miller, me, Rich Jenny, Carol Leifer. Bam! Oh my god. Uh, and That's then if incredible. if they, if if it was still a club there, mm -hmm. then Seinfeld would come in, and then <laughs> Riser would come in, and 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 Jay Leno and everybody else. Wow. That's I. That's where my I think my manager contacted you. That's where he worked. He worked at Spotlight. Yeah, and he has yes. stories from he has stories of his mob. When you as soon as you said the mob thing, I was like, this is what he's been telling me <laughs> for the last. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, the guy who ran it was uh, a guy named Bob Williams. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you rarely even saw Bob, let alone meet him. And if Bob right. wanted to meet with you, either something's going great or something's going horrible. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so they said that Bob wants to meet with you. And it's a good thing. He just wants to talk about some concerts or something like that where you can open right. for somebody. So I went, oh, great. So I'd never seen Bob's office up at Spotlight in New York. Mm -hmm. so, and, and incidentally, it's L-I-T-E, Spotlight. 
Right. You know, they're not fucking around. They're going full Long Island. They're right. not messing around. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I go into Bob's office and it's it's a long and narrow like a railroad car and the size mm-hmm. of a railroad car. Right. And at one end is Bob's desk. Mm-hmm. And way at the other end, not in front of his desk, way at the entire other end of the room are two chairs. Holy and a little God. table with water. Mm-hmm. So I go uh, you know, they escort me and Bob's not in yet. I go, am I supposed to sit at the table? Yeah, sit at the table. So I sit at the table. I'm having one. I said, this is weird. This has got to be a joke or something. Right. Bob walks in from some secret fucking door in the back. <laughs> Sits at his desk and goes, Cesario, how are you? And I go, holy Christ. <laughs> this is the perfect distance. <laughs> it's now, like that old MTV commercial where the dude's sitting too close and getting blown away. <laughs> yes. Wow. That's incredible. The, the best. Um, the what did you, do you remember your first paid gig? Uh, yeah. Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I started to do stand up comedy. Nice. I went in, uh, they had a burgeoning scene in 1980, but they only had about five decent comics. Right. And suddenly they were getting repeat audiences at the one club mm-hmm. and they needed new blood. And myself and a guy named Joel Madison, who went on to, uh, uh, write on Roseanne and create Malcolm and Eddie and uh, wow. it's done a ton of stuff. He and I were, were like the new blood in town and we both love to write. So mm-hmm. they got us up on stage right away. And I was cranking 10 minutes. I was getting two and a half hours of stage time a week wow. within a year wow. of moving to Minneapolis. And within about eight weeks, they started paying us. Holy shit. Wow. Yeah. Was it, how was the, uh, so like most of the time, I feel like it either goes one of two ways. First time on stage, you either crush, and then the rest of the time is miserable, like the next time you go to perform, or you do badly, and then the next time is better. What was your experience like? Was it like first time kill? I had and then- done an open mic in Los Angeles in uh, the late 70s. I'd come out to visit uh, uh, some relatives, mm-hmm. and uh, I'd snuck away and done the store. And I got, I think, one titter uh, in the five minutes, and that was it. But I didn't, I was so high on pure mm-hmm. adrenaline. And uh, the fellow who ran the open mic at the time, a great comedian named Robert Aguayo, uh, told me afterwards, he said, uh, Listen, I think you got something. Why don't you come back to the workshops on Sunday? And I literally said, Well, I'm just out here uh, for the week, uh, but thank you. Uh, if I ever get back. I mean, literally, it was like that, that horrible. Yeah. Um, and then I did one in New York at the improv and I didn't get on until two 30 the next year. And, uh, and, uh, there was one drunk at the table, but I got to see that whole show. And that's back when MCs were the star of the show. Oh, we're professional. Yeah. Like the MCs would bring up the MCs were, you know, Joe Piscopo emceed the show I was on. Right. Wow. And he would would pass you too. Right. He he could, or he would just, what he did was he wouldn't do any material between the early comics. Then the crowd would come in. Then he did a 35 minute set. Wow. That's when he wanted to, that was the way the rooms used to run. Uh, So I got to see that, but, and I didn't get anything that second time. Then I did one in Chicago and I got medium. So every year from 77, 78, 79, finally in 80, I moved to Minneapolis and I said, I got to do this regularly. And the first time I got decent response, and then it built from there and pretty quick because, you know, you're like, I mean, like I say, you're getting all that stage time. Yeah. You can make all these mistakes. There were no phones that took pictures. <laughs> you made horrible mistakes in the privacy of a shitty club in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and got to pay those dues and, and, uh, and, and make your bones, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's insane now, man. Everybody's got a fucking camera oh or... And it's like, there's no, even, you know, it used to just fucking drive me crazy is like, even if you were doing gigs where you knew you wanted to go bomb in them, uh, they yeah. would be like, you're going to bring your A game, right? I'm it's like, dude, I'm in a fucking, you know, quick check. Like, there's no, you know what I mean? Like, why would I do that here? Why would I bring, you're not even paying. Like, this is insane. That's but hilarious. They would get, you're in the middle of your set, $45. We can't cover that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly bad. it's just but they but fucking those, think, that builds a whole different kind of muscle and now you're doing this yeah. and you're doing whatever else you're doing and uh, i yeah. can see those muscles stretching into other areas of comedy for all these young performers it's, yeah it's, it's 
It's a different kind of dues and, and it is. in a way a lot harder, uh, in a way a lot harder. Yeah, I it it is. It's fr- it can be extremely frustrating. I'm always, I was always grateful for doing like the the crappy gigs. Even I mean, I you know probably not at the time, but uh, like I have friends who just came up through comedy festivals, and then I watch them go into um, any kind of real setting, any kind yeah, of comedy yeah. club out on the road. Like I would bring them out on the road with me, and they would not be able to if it was if it was not going exactly their way, or if it was not that kind of festival audience, or right. you know whatever, man. Fuck they could, and I would be like, "Oh, this is why I did all that shit in the beginning because none of this phases me anymore." Yeah, there's a survival muscle you learn to build that becomes a very strong and helpful muscle to you later down the line. Mm-hmm. And I think what you have to uh, keep an eye out for is to not allow that to be your strongest muscle right. eventually, creatively, yeah. that your creative instincts are still acknowledged inside yeah. yourself. You know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think there's another thing, too, is like, uh, I don't know if you guys did this when you were starting, but I always pictured the gig that I was going to to be better than it was when I got there. Like, um, like I, I, had, I got a I was I was like 20, 22, maybe. And it was like uh, I got hired to do a gig in the Catskills. And it was like at the time, like for when I I'd started when I was 20 um, and then I was super excited because Catskills, I'm thinking Buddy Hackett, I'm thinking, you know, sure. it's going to be the tradition. It was a fucking barn outside. Um, there was a pig being roasted during wow. my set. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I was like, I will never um, try to imagine what the gig is going to be like before. <laughs> I get there yeah, again. no, you don't. The, one of the greatest, literally, it turned out to be a phenomenal gig. But one of the tougher gigs, I was already at a stage. I was actually, it's, it was when I was already producing and writing mostly, but I was still mm-hmm. going out and doing some gigs, especially back in the Midwest where I'm from. So mm. we were doing this gig um, with Dave Mordahl, who had finished a close second, I think, on the very first season of Last Comic Standing, oh, and right. but had chosen to live back in Minnesota. Killer comic, unbelievable writer. And right. Scott Hansen, who's a legend back in, in the Twin Cities, mm-hmm. who is literally a premise bonfire, he will do a joke on a thousand premises in a seven minute set. And you think, I got nothing left. I got to follow that. How do I? <laughs> <laughs> but he's a tremendous comic and also a great writer. So we were, we were doing these gigs together and Scott was booking them. And one of them was at the Wilmer Ballroom outside mm-hmm. of St. Paul, Minnesota. And I thought, all right, we get to the Wilmer Ballroom. It is a biker bar. It is just, <laughs> but it's big. So right. And I walk in. And there are two, I'm not kidding, six foot five bouncers mm-hmm. taking a six foot three guy out already. It's <laughs> 630 at night. They're muscling him out and he goes, I wouldn't say anything when the comics were on. <laughs> wow. wow. And then they turn and they threw out the right 18 people because the rest of the night went great. Holy shit. Yeah. Oh my God. That's great. I did one in a theater uh uh, no, no, no. Wait, hold on. This is what they said. They were like, hey, do you want to come and do this theater? Uh, it's in like somewhere in like Washington, New Jersey, which I've been all over New Jersey. I've never been to this t- at the time. And I was like, yeah, it sounds fun. And they were like, do you know any of the comics? Which is just a great thing for a comic here because you bring your buddies. So I was like, yeah, do I know any comics? So I'm like, this is going to be great. It's going to be me and a couple other guys. We're going to have a great time in this fucking theater. You know, it's going to be a nice green room. We get there. It's a fucking abandoned movie theater. And oh, uh, it was, and they still had two other theaters on each end playing a movie. It was like a war oh, movie. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So we're in the middle one and it's, a, and it's slanted. So you walk all the way down to where the screen used yes. to be. And as we're doing our sets, you just like, <laughs> <laughs> playing this movie from both sides. Take and they the were like, beach. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, Good it's Lord. like it's saving private Ryan or whatever. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, I was like, Oh my God, it's so fucking hilarious now. That is crazy. Yeah. It's good shit, man. Well, if you guys don't mind, I actually have to go have dinner. Yeah, I'm absolutely. dude. Yeah. I'm sorry. I kept you an extra 20. No, minutes no, no, no. I had a blast. Awesome. Thank you. Before you go, let me ask you this. If you had one piece of advice to give your younger self now, what would it be? Oh, wow. Well, I can go think... back in time. Huh? I would probably say, um, be, uh, more self-assured mm. you know learn how to respect your whatever you're doing is as good as whatever anybody else is doing I even if it's that. not yet yeah you know 
you know, be centered. Try, try to find your center as a human being before you find it as a comic. Cause I think I wow. kind of reverse engineered that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that was out here doing a lot of jokes and some got funny and then I got success and then I had to go, Holy shit. I don't really need that. Uh, you know, the love of strangers anymore. So what the fuck am I doing this? For? What am I really doing this for? What do I want to say? Mm -hmm. Then you got to kind of cobble that together. So, you know, work on the human qualities first, I would say. Wow. Wish I That's great, man. That. Yeah. Perfect appreciate answer. It. Thanks, man. I appreciate and that. I'll I appreciate go it. drink. Yeah. <laughs> 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 got to go work on me. <laughs> <laughs> you got a crazy straw and a bottle of Jack. <laughs> I'm actually oh. at a gig. I just flip around here and there's an audience. Is... <laughs> That's all green screen. Just rip the curtain back behind you. And it's like, now nah, you don't have to pay Pomeroy. I love it. Over Romo, this will be like a gig for him. Oh, fucking awesome, dude. Thanks so much for coming My on, pleasure. man. I had a blast. Thank you, guys. I, Thank I you. really, really enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Oh, good. We Thanks, man. Take care. Yeah. Have a great Dystopia tonight.